Hi again and welcome to the first unit in week two. In week two, we'll take our knowledge from week one and dive a little deeper. In this first unit, which we've called Building with Blocks, Eliminating Chaos, we'll have some more fun with randomness and if all goes to plan, we'll be able to observe something surprising. Okay, let's get started. In this unit, we want to use an algorithm to build a pattern. An algorithm is basically a recipe with steps that you need to perform to solve a problem. So for example, if your problem is you really need to have muffins because your mother's birthday is today, you can take this recipe which says preheat the oven to 200 degrees, put the eggs in your bowl, put flour to it and so on and so on. Um, and this is basically an algorithm for baking. Now we're going to use an algorithm for computer science which will help us draw patterns. This algorithm works, starts with a dot. So we're going to draw a costume for our sprite, which will be a black dot. This is our dot. Because we want to stamp multiple dots on the stage, I'm going to resize it a little bit. So we can say set the size to 5%, so it's a little bit smaller. And what our dot should do, we will have a triangle from objects. So I will make three more objects maybe change the color that we can see which one is which. So I will set the pen color in this one to yellow. So now we have a blue one, a red one and a yellow one which form a triangle. And I have my dot and the algorithm says the dot picks one random item of these elements and then points towards that item and then moves half the distance to it and then stamps. And it's doing that all over again forever. And we want to see what happens then. This sounds kind of complicated, but we're going to build it so it's easier to understand. We want to start our program with when the green flag is clicked. We want to clear the stage just in case if there was something from before. Now we want to set the size of our sprite, of our dot, to 5%. The next thing we want to do is we want to send our sprite to a random position on the stage. So we go to motion and take the go to random position block again. The next thing is that we are going to pick a random item of these three. For that we can go to sensing and use the my <laughs> block. It says my neighbors now, but I can click the drop down menu and choose my other sprites. What it will do when I click it is give me a list with all my other sprites. So there's the yellow one, the blue arrow and the red arrow. So this is a list with all the sprites I have besides my dot. Now I want to pick a random item of that list. So I go to variables and say item random of my other sprites. Now it will give me a random element of these three every time I click the block. Now I got the yellow one, the red one, the yellow one, the blue one, the yellow one. You see where that goes. So we are going to make a variable and we are going to assign this random item to that variable. So I will make a variable called target and I will say set the target to a random item of my other sprites. If I click target now, I can see now it's the yellow arrow here. If I click it again, target will be the red arrow, any random item of these three. The next thing in the algorithm was point towards that target. So I can take the point towards block and can say point towards the target. Then I want to move half the distance towards my target. So I say move and then I want to go the distance to my target but only half the way. So I say divide that by 2. What happens now is when I click that you see that the random target that was chosen was red now my dot moved from here to there. Try to remember where the dot is and then I click it again. 
Now it was the yellow item and it moved half the distance from here to there. If I click it again, it will move half the distance from here to the blue one. We can stamp that now run that script multiple times and I can also adjust, uh, uh, attach a head block, for example, when space is pressed. So we can try that in full screen. So when I press space now, it will move, it will choose a random element of these three and it will move half the distance towards that and then stamp the dot. Now we'll just keep hitting space so you see what happens here. I can do that a lot of times. So you see that there's this triangular shape emerging. So I will close that now. The dots are kind of big, so for running our final script, I will um, decrease the size of the dots, so let's say to 2%. We will click the green flag and see if we can still find our dot and stamp it. Looks like it works. Maybe we can say 3% just to be sure. And then we want to repeat this step over and over again. So we will just wrap a forever loop around that and try to run the script over and over again. So I will hide the variable and then we will go to full screen again and click the green flag. So here's our dot and now we get this triangular pattern. We can try it again with even smaller dots this one's still kind of big. So let's just do that again and say we only want to size 2%. Try it again. Or we can even go for 1%. That was a really big dot. Start it again. Yeah, this one looks better. So now we have the small dots which will form this pattern. And I can also say do that faster so I can um, start the turbo mode by clicking shift and then pressing the green flag again and now it's um, super fast. So you see this pattern that is emerging here it's called a Sierpinski triangle um, which is triangles inside of triangles inside of triangles forever. Um, I can also change the objects because I'm using objects here so I can drag that over here and now it's working with the new position of the object. And I can drag that over here and I can work with the new position of the object and I can do that again. And by the way, that I can assign an object to a variable is one of the big ideas of object-oriented computing. And I can live edit that again and again. Um, and this thing is called emergence. So there's a pattern that is, is, is emerging out of these three elements out of the original system and it wasn't really clear that this was going to happen and it's super cool. There are also other patterns that are um, evolving when you add some restraints to that system and some conditions um, for choosing the objects which will be your exercise for today. So that wraps it up for this unit. We saw how surprising patterns can emerge from randomness by using algorithms. Have fun with the exercise and we'll see you next time. Welcome to our unit, rumor has it, building a function. In this unit, we are going to gossip with our homemade reporters and we want to build random sentences and let our sprites spread the news. Our sentences are going to have a simple subject, predicate, object structure and we are going to pick random elements from a pool of persons or verbs. So we are going to create this pool using a new data structure which is called lists. You can find lists under the variables category. All the red blocks are for list operations. So I'm going to put the list over here. List is an is a data type where you can enter different things, for example, words like my name or numbers like 42 or even other lists like the list with my favorite animal, which is a wombat and my favorite flower, which is a daisy. And I can even add blocks to lists, for example, the plus or times operator. And I can store as many values as I want in a list and I can also, uh, uh, entries can be uh, twice in lists um, 
And now I click that and you can see that I get a list with my name, with the number, with another list and with another block. Um, and I could save that, for example, um, to a variable or I could make um, a reporter out of it that picks random elements. So I'm going to make a new list for the persons of our sentence. Um, you can expand the list by clicking this right directed arrow or you can shift click if you want to add multiple um, elements to the list at once. And now I wrote down um, a list of persons that we can use for our reporter. For example, our dog, my math teacher, my best friend, our landlord, my flatmate, a wombat, or also my name, or Jens. And now we have a list with all the persons where we can pick random elements from. In the list category, you can also find a block that can pick items from a list. Right now, it would pick the first element of the list, which would, which would be our dog. But I can also tell it to pick a random element of our list. These um, orange stripes here in the uh, input indicate that this, is an, this, that this input should be a list. So I can add my list here and now it will give me a random element of my list each time. So I click now and it was my math teacher. Now it's our dog, Jadga, Jens, our landlord, my flatmate, Jens. So it's randomly picking elements from this list. Now we are going to make a reporter out of that. So we go to make a block. This should be a list block. And then we choose reporter here and say person and hit OK and we go get back to the block editor. Here you can see that you already have this report block in the block editor because it's going to be a reporter. So we can just drag our item random off this list into the reporter and say apply and then we get our new block and we can just test it. So when I click it now it should give me a different person each time I click it. A wombat, our landlord, Yadga, my best friend, seems to work. So we can close that block by clicking OK. Mathematically speaking, this is not a function because functions uh, in math have inputs and always give the same output for a given input. Um, here we don't have an input and the output differs, but in a computer science sense, this is a function. So we're going to talk um, as functions in, uh, throughout this video. So the next thing we are going to do is the exact same thing for the actions. So I go to make a block. Again, it's going to be a reporter and I call it action. And I will add a random or I will pick a random element of a list. And this list contains all my actions, which are, for example, like singing with or draw a a painting off. We can expand this block painting. Or we can do is scared of or wants to start a band with or runs faster than. So you can just input any um, action you like or any verb you like and then you can just click OK and we get a new block for our action. If I click it, it says is scared of, wants to start a band with, so it's again picking random elements of our list. Now we want to join that together to a sentence. So we go to operators and go to the join block. This one says join hello world, so I can add words in here but I can also add my person in here, then I need to take care that I also do spaces because the words should be separated by spaces. So I do a space and then I say my person, then my person does the action, then I need another space and then I want to have the person again as an object. So this should give me a sentence. Let's try that. 
a wombat, like singing with a wombat. So now person was the same thing twice. We can try it again. Our dog is scared of our landlord. My best friend runs faster than our landlord. So you can make sentences like that. So now the last thing we want to do in this video is we can make our sprite say that. For that, we can either just use the say block. So we can say, say our gossip. And now it, our sprite is saying the gossip. We can also make our sprite have a costume just to look at it, make it look a little nicer. So I go to the costume library and pick Alonso. So now Alonso is telling all the news. And every time I click that block, Alonso will tell me a new story. We can also make a block for gossip. So I will just do another reporter and call it gossip. And it will just report back this function. And now I can say, say gossip and it can tell the news. So what we want to do now is we want also try out the text to speech library in Snap. For that, we go to the da uh, data menu, file menu, and click on libraries and import the text to speech library. This will give you two new blocks which will go to the sound category. If I click import now, it will import the library and I can find these blocks um, in the sound category. And now I can just tell it to speak the gossip with an accent. Our landlord likes singing with my math teacher. Let's just try it again. A wombat draws a painting of my math teacher. So that already brings us to the end of this unit. In summary, we learned how to write and use our own reporters and became acquainted with the data type lists. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next unit. Goodbye. and welcome to week two, unit three, which is all about cloning. In this unit, we're going to take command of big clone swarms to create an animated flower. So here goes. In Snap, you can use clones if you need multiple agents that behave similarly. So for that, I will do a quick demonstration. I will write a short script, which will move my sprite in random speed over the stage forever. So we take the move block and then I say I pick a random number of steps between 1 and 10. I want to do that forever. And just in case the sprite meets the edge, I want to bounce back. So I also add the if on edge bounce block. We can just click the green flag to see if that works. That looks fine. So I will stop the script and put the sprite back to the center. And now I can create clones in two ways. The first way is that I say right click the sprite and clone it. So here I have a second sprite and when I mouse over it, you can see that the parent of this one is the original sprite. I can just rename it clone so you can see that better. So this one is the sprite and this one is the clone which is derived from our original sprite. So they both share the same scripts. This one has the same script as the original sprite. And if I move the clone to the center and now hit the green flag, you can see that they both do the same, but still their behavior differs a little bit because I pick a random speed or movement um, steps for every time the block is executed and this differs in both clone and sprite. So the clones in Snap or in programming basically work like clones in biology do. Um, they share the same genetic material, which in this case would be the scripts, but how the manifestation of this um, genetic material is in real life also depends on external factors. For example, in this case, the randomness of this block in biology, this would be something like nutrition or climate conditions of our individual. So as we're talking about biology, let's get back to our virtual flower. I will just delete these scripts and my clone. 
um, delete my clone. Um, and what we want to do now is we want to create a flower which starts with a small circle, colored circle in the center. And when I hit the green flag, this circle turns. And while turning, it changes the color and releases petals to the outside. And the petals start moving to the edge and decrease their speed. And when they reach the edge or the speed is lower than a specified number, then we will delete the clones. So this is how our animation will look like later. And now we're going to program it. So the first thing we're going to do is we will draw the inner circle for our flower. I go to the paint editor, and I maybe we'll go for yellow, and we can draw the circle. Um, if you click shift, you can do proper circles. If you want more like oval thingies, you can not hit shift. So I click OK now and move my sprite back to the center. Now we are going to program the starting script. So our program starts when the green flag is clicked. And then we forever want to turn our sprite, want to change the color effect, and then we want to create clones. So we say when the green flag is clicked, forever turn, and we do something like 64 degrees, then change the color effect. by a small number, let's say 0.3, and then we want to create clones. Here's the block that says create a clone, and th in the drop-down menu you have to pick myself. So when I click the green flag now, I see that the color changes, and I also, yeah, because it's a circle I cannot see it moving, and it's also creating clones, but as the clones are not moving, they are all right on top of the, the original script. So the next thing that we're going to do is we need to um, create a script for the clones. So there's this block that says, when I start as a clone. And this block is executed whenever I clone my sprite. So when we start as a clone, we need to set a speed at the beginning. For that, we are going to take a script variable. Last time we used variables, we, we made a global variable that is accessible for all sprites by clicking make a variable here. Now we cannot make a global variable because the speed is different for every clone that we, make, that we have. And global variables would be the same. So here we're going to take a script variable, which is only accessible from inside a script. So when I attach that here, I can double click it or click it and rename it to speed. And now I can set the speed to my start value. When I click the drop down menu and say set speed to 2.5. When I click that now, it will tell me that the variable is not it does not exist in this context because this block is not attached to the, to the script. And also when I click the drop down now, I cannot find speed because this block is not attached to the script where the script variable belongs to. So I will attach it again. And the next thing is that the sprite or the clone should move to the direction it was initially set to until it the, the speed decreases under a given condition that I will specify. So I will use the repeat until block. And I can write a condition in here in this hexagonal slot. And the condition would be speed is smaller than some number. So I would say repeat this until speed is smaller than, let's say, 0.2. And now I will. Um, make the sprite or make the clone move by using the move block and say always move the speed. When I do that now, it will just do it forever and the things the speed won't decrease and I will get more clones as, you, as indicated by the number here. At some point, I want to delete my clones again, so I need to decrease my speed that the repeat loop stops some time. 
You can delete all clones by just hitting the stop button. There's also a block that says delete this clone, so I can also delete my clones programmatically. So now we want to decrease the speed. So we say change the speed, but we want to change it relatively. So we say we want the new speed to be the 99% of the speed that we had before. So we're going to take an operator and say, set the speed to our original speed times 0 0.995, for example. And when the repeat loop stops, we want to delete the clones. So we go into control and take the delete this clone block and add that to the end of our script. You see that you cannot attach anything um, after that block because this one deletes the clone and then the clone is gone. So you cannot go further with your script. So when I click the green flag now, it's super fast. Why is that? Um, maybe let's do 0 0.02 here. Ah, and we always also want to know we want to change. Uh, we want to set the speed to our original speed times that, not change the speed. So we're going to move our sprite back to the center. And now we want to set the speed to the speed, 99% of the speed we had before. I just changed it, which was wrong. So now let's try that again. Yeah, this is how I wanted it to look like. Um, this was how the original flower looked as well. Um, we can make some small adjustments to our project. So for example, we can say um, we wanted to delete all clones when the green flag is clicked so that if we started with clones, we don't have our screen full of clones or you can change the color effect and other things. So um, here we just made a clone flower by using sw cloning swarms. As usual, we've provided you with an exercise to get you experimenting, as I just mentioned. So go ahead and see what you can do. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to jump into the discussion forum. See you there. Welcome back to our course, Get Coding with Snap. This is week two, unit four. And I'm very excited to be showing you today one of my absolute favorite things in computer science, recursion. It's also somewhat of an experiment because many people believe that recursion is very hard. I'd like to show you that in fact it's not, and what's more, it can be fun. I'd like to start out by explaining that there are two kinds of recursion. And we'll start with the first one that is, as we say, linear recursion. Let me explain this to you. Let's say I would like to make a block that does a countdown. So I'd go to the looks category, and I have a say block and a think block. But I don't have one that counts down from a number. So I'll make a new block by clicking on the plus sign, and I'm giving it a name. I'm making a block in the looks category. It's going to be a command block, and it's going to be named count down from a number. I'm pressing OK, and it's opening the block editor, where I get what we say the prototype of the block. Now, as you already can guess from drawing all those rectangles and squares, number is going to be an input. So I'm clicking on number and specify it as an input. I press OK. Now, number has turned into an input, which, if I press Apply, on the outside is just a slot in which I can type in something. And on the inside, the input is a variable that I can drag off. So how would we count down from five? The usual way, the one that you've learned up until now, is to use a repeat block. So we could say, repeat the number. We could say, say that number. I'm just going to say it for one second. 
And then we'd change the number by minus 1. Let's try that out. I'm going to apply this. Applying leaves the block editor open, whereas OK closes it. Now I've defined the countdown block, and I'm going to click on the countdown block to try it. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and there it goes. It repeated five times. That wasn't too hard, was it? It also wasn't recursion. So let me show you a different way how we can do the same thing. Obviously, at one point, we want to say a number. What if we threw away all the repetition and all the changing? We start with saying the number, and then the next step we want to do is we want to count down from the number minus 1. So we go to the hooks category, and I can take the same block that I'm defining, drag it into the block editor, and say, now count down the number minus 1. What do you think happens if we try the same script now? Shall we try it? Let's press Apply and click. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2. Oh my god, it doesn't stop. Let's stop it by pressing the red stop sign. So we've succeeded in making the same thing as with the repeat block, except it doesn't stop. So. One thing to look at this is that it'll do what we want, but we need to specify a condition when it stops, or the other way around, a condition while it runs. You already know that conditions are the if blocks. So let's go to the control category and define the condition under which it runs. Obviously, it is just going to run for positive numbers. So. Let's say if the number is greater than 0, we want to do the countdown. Now let's apply this and let's add another test script, another block to our test script, which is liftoff. Let's see whether it counts down and says liftoff. Five. Four, three, two, one, lift off. We've just made our first recursive script. Recursion is when we use a block within its own definition. We're using a block on itself. As you can see in this simple example, recursion can be used to simulate a repetition. As you can also see in this example, you always need one condition when using recursion, that is, when it should stop or when it should go. In computer science, we're calling this a base case. In this case, we only use the block once within its own definition, which is where we're calling it linear recursion, or because it comes as the last block in its definition, tail recursion. It is at the very end of the definition. Let's try what happens if we use it more than once in the definition. And for this, we're going to do a whole new example and try to draw something. I'd like to show you how to draw a tree. This is the classic example from Logo, and it never fails to amaze me. For this, we're going to use this sprite and drag it down to the bottom of the stage and turn it so it points upwards. We can rotate it and make it turn upwards. Now, let's make it draw a tree, and let's make a block that draws a tree. In order to draw something, we first 
want to clear whatever is on the stage. We want to put the pen down and we probably want to press the green flag at one point. And then we want to make a block that draws a tree. It is going to be a motion block. So I'm clicking on the plus sign to define a new block. And it's going to be called tree. It's going to have two inputs, a level and a size. If I press OK now, once again the block editor opens and I can specify which ones of these label elements are going to be inputs. So level is going to be an input as is size. You can already see the tree block sitting in the palette. Once I press apply, the inputs get updated. So how are we going to draw a tree? First, we're going to draw the stem. It is going to go upwards by the size. We're going to put in the move block and say move the size. And we always want to end up where we started from, so we're going to move back again. Moving backwards, we can save, we can move by just going the same size in the opposite direction, which you can accomplish by multiplying it with, with minus one. Now I'm going to apply it, take out the tree block, and say it's going to be a tree of level one with the size of 100. And if I click this, it draws a line up and down. That's the stem. Now let's draw the branches. Once the sprite goes up, we want to go left and draw, and then go right and draw. So let's insert the according blocks. We're moving, then we go left, let's say 25 degrees. Then we turn right, 25 times 2 degrees, which is 50 degrees. And then we need to turn back again by 25 degrees. So we're at the same direction as we started out with. And how do we draw the branches? Here's the beauty of recursion. We already know how to draw the branches. The branches are just trees. So we can drag in the tree. And after we turn, we put in the tree block. And usually, if you look at trees, it's a little, the branches are smaller than the trees. So we can multiply the size by something that makes it slightly smaller. Let's say 0.7. And we can also decrement the level, make it smaller, same as we did in the countdown example. So we're decrementing the level. Now we did it for this one direction. And we could just copy this block by clicking on the picture of it so it only copies this one block and insert it after we turn to the right. Now we have two blocks that we're defining in its own definition. Let's try this and see what happens. As you can see, what is happening isn't what we were expecting. In fact, it is never coming back. The sprite keeps on turning and running forever. What did we forget? Right. We forgot the one condition that tells us when to stop or how long it should run. Remember in the countdown procedure, we only let it run while the level was greater than zero. So let's insert the same condition here in the tree block. Go to the control category, drag out the if block, and wrap it around the body of the definition, and insert the same condition here, greater than, level is greater than zero. And let's apply that. Move the sprite back to its position. Make sure it's aligned right. Rotate it to the top. 
And Nadis tried the same thing again. Running a tree level one of size 100. And that is our stem. Let's change the level to two and see what happens. See, it's working. Now we have a stem in two branches. Let's try the number three. Uh-oh. Now you can clearly see that we've got a tree with two trees branching out. That is fun. Let's try the number five. It's taking a while to draw this, and already we're seeing something emerge where each of these branches looks like a tree. This is something we call self-similarity, and it's a concept often found in nature. It's what mathematicians call a fractal. You see, fractals can be done using recursion in computer science, and they're hugely fun. Hey, how about we put in the number eight? Now it's kind of almost running too long. Like, how long will it take to finish? Is there something we can do to make it faster? All right. You remember Yetka showed you that there was a block that makes everything very fast. It is called the warp block, and it is found in the control category. So I'm going to close the definition and take out the warp block and wrap it around my tree and increase the number to 10 and see what happens. Boom! I just got a tree with more detail. Hey, there's one more thing I'd like to show you to make working with trees even more fun. Let's drag this a little down so you can see the whole tree and open the tree definition. In the context menu, you can edit the block and we can play with the pen size that's drawing the tree. And as you can see, the level is counting down, same as we did in the countdown procedure. So it starts out large and then gets smaller, pretty much like the branches and twigs of our tree. How about we use this for the pen size? So whenever we draw something, we're setting the pen size to the level that's passed in. Let's try this. There. That almost looks like a real tree now. Hey, have I got a deal for you. We've got some fun exercise for you to play more with this and to turn it into a more vivid tree. I'd be curious to find out what your ideas are and be happy to meet you in the forums. Welcome back to our course, Get Coding with Snap. This is week two, unit five, where I hope to get you all excited about experimenting with animation and building a fireworks project. Let's look at animation. I'm going to take the sprite and rotate it so it points up. Now, I want it to move forward and backward again. In the previous project, we've done this by moving 60 steps and then moving back 60 steps. If I click on Move, the sprite advances. Clicking on Move minus the number of sticks retracts it. However, if I combine these two blocks and then click on the script, Nothing seems to happen. And that is because it's happening so fast you can't see it. Now this kind of programming is useful if you just want to draw something. But if you'd like to animate something, and it really is too fast. So how can we address this? One way how we can make something move slower is to move it a tiny bit but repeatedly do so. Then we can go to the control category, drag out a repeat 10 block, and only move 
six steps at a time. Now, if I click this, it advances and I can follow it. Now, if I move on the, if I click on the other move block, it retracts again the whole thing. Now, if I combine these two blocks, I get a script that actually animates my sprite, my, my sprite while retracting it. In the motion category, you'll find a block that kind of already does that. This is the glide block. You can, as inputs, you can specify a time in which it is moving and some coordinates, an X dimension and a Y dimension. So if I want to glide the sprite into the center in one second, I can click on this glide block and sure enough, it does that, just that. But often, what you want to do is not go to a particular coordinate, but move a number of steps, gliding and animating it. To do this, we have a library in Snap. You click on the File menu. You can go to Libraries and open a browser of extensions of additional blocks that you can get into Snap. Somewhere in between, you'll find a library called Animation. If you click on it once, you get a preview of the blocks. Then you can click Import, and it'll import the blocks you've just seen, much as you often do with the Tools library. Now, if you scroll down in the Motion category, you see another Glide block, Glide a number of steps in a specified time. Now we can use this to glide 60 steps in one second. Let's try this. Now we're getting pretty much the same thing as we did before. It glides at constant speed and then it retracts all at once. That's not very exciting. If we want to build a fireworks, we want to build an explosion, we want it to accelerate and decelerate. And this is what the third input of this glide block is for. Here's a drop down with a bunch of options of how this is going to advance and how this is going to retract. I'm going to choose the quadratic in function, which makes it decelerate. If I click this and try this, you'll see the sprite slowly decelerates until it stops moving and then retracts again. You can experiment with other options in here um, to uh, find out how you can make sprites move in interesting ways. OK, so much for animation. Now let's build an explosion. I'm going to make a block, and it's going to be explode. And since we're going to use recursion for this, I'm go also going to add the level So we say OK, and turn the level into an input, much as we've done in the countdown project and in the tree project. So now, I've got the block prototype that defines how an explosion is going to work. And what I want to do in this explosion, I want to drag in this script and make it glide and retract but after it's moved, it actually should break up in parts and kind of like a tree move apart. And I've just said it. It's kind of like a tree. So, as you've seen Yatka show you, we have script variables. Script variables are variables just like variables you can make in the variables category by pressing the make a variable block, except that script variables only are valid inside the script in which they're used. This is a concept called scope in computer science. The scope of a script variable is the script. I want a variable that defines the number of branches I'm going to do. 
So I'm going to rename this to branches. Then I want to set the branches to an arbitrary number. See, the trick is with an explosion, it's not just like a tree that it always just branches twice, but we want it to branch a number of times and not always the same number of times. So we're going to take out the pick random block to create arbitrary branches. And I want the least one to be three and at most six because you'll notice that if you create more branches, things might get out of hand pretty quickly with explosions. Then we'll add something that you know from the draw a polygon project. We want to do a full turn and fork off new explosions. For a full turn, we're going to use the repeat block. And we're repeating the number of branches and turning the sprite. And the amount we're going to turn it is the full circle turn divided by the number of branches. So that's 360 degrees divided by the, by the branches. And at every turn, we want to explode another one. So we want to take out the explode block, except it doesn't yet look like this one. So let's first press apply. So now the level input has become an input slot. So I'm putting the explode level block inside the repeat block. And as you've seen in the tree project, we're going to count down the level by one. Now, this looks almost right. Except remember, when I drew that tree, at first it ran forever and it didn't ever stop. And that was because I forgot the condition that tells me uh, how long this is going to go on what is called base case in recursion. So the base case was we're only going to do this while the level is larger than one. So I go to the control category, get out the conditional block, the if block, and wrap it around the branching script. I'm going to take out the retraction and add it to the if block and set the predicate, the condition, inside the hexagonal slot of the F block. Now what's happening is, at the first level, it should just move, and then at any level above, it should turn and draw other branches. Let's try this. Pressing apply, taking out the explode block, and specify the level one. Let's click this. You see that? It's moved and it retract. Well, we could do that before, right? Let me add a green flag hat block to that and increase the number by two. I'm going to press the green flag and watch what happens. This doesn't look like a fireworks, does it? It looks like it's drawing a tree. What should actually happen is all of these should be forking off at once, otherwise it's not, ex not an explosion. How are we going to do this? We're going to use clones and, yes, parallelism. You already know about clones. We have the clone blocks. When I start as a clone, I can create a clone of myself. But here, what I want to do is, I want this script to control the new clones. So I want to create a new clone of myself using a reporter. And I want this script to tell this clone to do something. There is a tell block in the control category. And we'll use the tell block to tell a new clone of myself to do what? Well, to explode. We're putting the explode block into the ring of the tell block. And then we turn, we put this back 
into the script where it belongs. Now what we're doing is, at every explosion, we're creating a new clone that does what we want it to do. Let's try this. I'm applying the script. I'm going to full screen. And I'm pressing the green flag. It is creating new clones, as you can see, but it's still not happening at the same time. And also notice how these clones stick around and don't go away. To make unwanted clones go away, we can simply press the red stop sign, or we can do it programmatically by using the delete this clone block. So I'm going to add this delete this clone block to the end of my script, but that still doesn't solve the problem how we're going to do it all at once. Remember parallelism? We use parallelism when we took the same hat block twice and added a different script under each. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it in Snap is to use a launch block. You'll find the launch block also in the control category. And what the launch block does is it basically starts a new parallel process a thread, so to say, with whatever is inside that ring. So I'm going to take the launch block and tell the new clone of myself to launch the explosion. That means it'll start the exploding script right away and not wait until it is finished and keep going on turning and creating new clones. Now let me try what happens. Again, I'm going to apply this. I'm going to go to full screen and press the green flag. Now we've got something that looks like an explosion of level two. Let's try it with level three. Now I'm looking for two explosions. I've got one, and I've got other ones. This seems to work. Um, let's try to make this a little bit more interesting. And we can do it more interesting by adding you guessed it, some more randomness. Randomness is fun and makes things more interesting. One interesting way where we can add randomness is in the amount of time it takes for each clone to reach its destination. We're always having one second. How about we vary that? We pick something in between 0 0.3 and one second, so now all these shards, all these clones, will it move at slightly different speeds? Let's again try this. Now you can see it already starts to look more interesting. Now another way how we can change this and make it more interesting is by also add some randomness to the level of explosion. What if the level of explosion could be in between two and, say, four. Let's again try this. And you can see this was just a level two explosion. Now we're getting more levels of explosion. And you can see many clones appearing. And this is something that is called exponential growth. OK, we've got the basics of the fireworks. As usual, let's add a slight twist to make this a little more interesting. One thing that's my favorite about Snap is that you can draw your own costumes and dress up your sprites with something that is interesting. I'm going to close the block editor because my script works and just work on the appearance of the project. Now, when I think about fireworks, firecrackers, I think about rockets and missiles. But hey, what if I want to share this project with somebody I really like and somebody I care for? Wouldn't it be great to have an explosion of, say, enthusiasm or love? One thing I'm good at is drawing hearts. So I'm going to draw this heart. I'm going to fill it with a color. And now, my sprite is a heart, but oh, it's lying sideways. And you already know about the rotation ways. 
can rotate anyway, can only face left, right, and actually I'm not interested in rotation, so I'm going to check the third option, which is don't rotate at all. Now it's upward again. Let's see what happens if I now let my heart explode. I get an explosion of hearts. Isn't that interesting? And now there are several ways in which you can make this even more interesting. For example, we could go in and increase the number of levels, and we could also change the size of the clones so that when each clone starts, it might be at a slightly different size. So we could launch the clone to be at a size that is also random. Say, you can experiment with the numbers, in between 30% and 80%. Now we've got an explosion of hearts. Isn't that neat? I'm sure you'll have lots of fun with the exercise we come up for you. And hey, if you've got any questions, I'll be hanging out in the forums and waiting for you there. See you. Hello and welcome to the final unit in our course, Get Coding with Snap. Well done for coming this far, you've almost made it. In this unit, you'll make your own action game and what's more, you'll even be able to play it on your smartphone. So at first, we need our sprite, which will throw clones at something. There's something we're going to program later. So we're starting with our first sprite and we're going to make it clone itself and then the clones move towards our mouse pointer. So we start with when the green flag is clicked because that will start our game. And then we probably want to make the sprite look upwards. For that we can use the point in direction block. And upwards is, you can either take the arrow and move it up or you can just click on up. So when the green flag is clicked, our sprite is moving, uh, is looking upwards. We can now move it to the bottom of the stage so that it doesn't touch the edge. The next thing we're going to do is we want to forever let our sprite clone itself whenever the mouse is clicked. So we take a forever loop and then we say wait until the mouse is clicked so it doesn't happen anything until I click the mouse. So we go to wait, and then we say wait until, and there's the mouse down button, which means that I press the mouse key. And then if the mouse key is pressed, I want to clone the sprite. So I say create a clone of myself. And the clone should always look in direction to the mouse pointer. So I also say point towards mouse pointer. So we can already try that. You see that I can create clones that look towards the mouse pointer, but right now they are not moving yet. So I will stop the script again and delete all the clones by pressing the stop button. And now we want to program what happens when the clone starts. So when I start as a clone, I want to move in direction of the mouse pointer as long as I, uh, until I reach the edge and then the clone should disappear. So we say repeat until touching the edge. move because we're already pointing towards the mouse pointer so we are we are in the right direction and we only need to move so maybe we go a bit slower let's say six steps so let's try that whenever i click our my sprite moves the thing is you see that i'm always getting more clones 
you see that small thing in the background here because I'm uh, it creates clones faster than I can click so I need to wait until the mouse is not down so it only creates one clone whenever I click the mouse so we are adding here wait until oh, let's stop that wait until not mouse down So now it's only creating one sprite as a t at a time. Right now this, the clones still stay up here. So what we're going to do is after uh, this loop is done, we're just going to delete the clones. Oh, let's try that. seems to work. So right now we create clones whenever I click the mouse and the clones move in direction of the mouse pointer until they touch the edge and then they disappear. So now we need another object that our clones can be thrown at. For that we say create another object and we want to import a costume for that. So we go to the file menu Oh, let's stop the program. We go to the file menu and say costumes and then we're going to import um, a balloon costume when the costume library is ready. So I'm going to balloon and there are already three balloons available. So I'm going for balloon 1A but you can pick whichever color you like. And then I say import um, and now I got a balloon costume. This is kind of big so we are first we're going to resize the balloon. So let's do size 50% and then we also want the balloons to appear somewhere at the bottom and then move upwards until they touch the edge and then they should disappear. Also when they get hit by the clones of this sprite they should disappear. So we start with the um, balloon moving upwards. So we want forever to create clones of the balloon in random time distances. So what we're going to do when the green flag is clicked, we want to create clones of the balloon. So we say forever create a clone of myself and then wait. So maybe we are adding the wait in front of the um, create a clone of myself so the game when it starts there's you have some time to adjust or start the game. So we have say wait and then we're going to wait random seconds. Let's say one, two, three. So what happens now when I click the, this script? It waits a random number of seconds and then creates a clone. Right now the clones are all on top of that. So when I move that, I see that I get a lot of clones. Um, so this works. So let's stop the, again, the, uh, this again. This is the original balloon and I will move it um, to the right um, Y position. So. Um, I can hide it now because I don't want to hit the original balloon because that cannot disappear. Um, so I, I'm going to hide this at the beginning of my script. And now when the um, balloon is cloned, it should appear at a random position somewhere on that line. So what we're going to do is we say when I start as a clone, set x to random position between minus 200 and 200. Okay, let's try that. Ah, also we of course need to show the balloon again. So let's try that again. So this was is our first clone, this is the second one, the third one, the fourth one. This seems to work. So we're going to 
um, stop our script. And what we're going to do next is that the balloons should move upwards. For that, we say repeat until touching edge again. And then they should change their Y position by, let's say, 2. Okay, let's try that. So this already looks kind of cool, but we could also animate the balloons a little bit. So we, are say, we say we also want to change the X position a little bit so we get a, like a small um, movement also in the X axis. For that, we can say change x by pick a random number between minus 4 and 4. Let's try it again. So now we al already have balloons that look really balloony. Um, what we need to do next is that we want to delete the clones whenever they touch the edge. So we go back and add a delete this clone at the end of our second script. And again, we're going to try it. Balloon moves upwards and it's going to be deleted whenever it touches the edge. Great. Now, we also need to include that the balloons should be deleted or the clones of the balloon should be deleted whenever they get hit by a clone of this sprite. So we add another if statement in this repeat until touching edge loop by saying if loop, you go going to touch the sprite, then also delete this clone. Now we can try it again. And now we can also use our, oh wow, this works. So now I got it and it, it deleted the clone. So this already works. So now we can start refining our project. The first thing we're going to do for that is um, we make our sprites undraggable so we don't drag them accidentally to somewhere where we don't want to have them. So we can um, uncheck this box here for the balloon. We can also name that sprite balloon and make the balloon undraggable. And we're also doing the same thing for the sprite. Just uncheck this box so now I cannot move the sprite anymore because it's undraggable. The next thing we're going to do is make a small animation whenever we um, can make it to hit the balloon because then we want to have a big splash. So for that, we draw another costume uh, with the paint editor. Um, we can pick a color with the pipette by clicking it and then go into somewhere on the balloon so it gets the same color as our balloon has. So I just take this one and now I'm going to draw my splash. And I'm going to fill it as well. I can say OK now. I go back to the balloon. And what I do now is I say whenever you touch the sprite, switch to the costume splash and stamp that on the stage. So we are going to say switch to costume. And I'm going to rename the costume to splash by right clicking rename. And now I can say switch to costume splash. And then also we're going to change the ghost effect uh, to set the ghost effect to, to make it a little more transparent so we can still see the balloon when our stage is full of splashes. So we set the ghost effect to, let's say, 80. And then we're going to stamp the costume on the stage. And then we're going to delete the clone. So let's try that again. We can also try it in full screen, maybe. Oh, this is not good. We're going to stop that again and going back to the balloon costume. And let's delete, uh, let's stop the project again. 
and start it again. Now we have the balloons and I can shoot at them and whenever I hit them, I get the splash. Ah, I kind of got good at that. Cool. Okay, now what we can do to make it a little more better looking, we can try to change the color of the balloons and also the color of the splashes and turn them a little bit each time they are printed on the stage or stamped on the stage. For that, we can add another block in here to turn the splashes a little bit. So we say turn a random number of degrees. Let's say pick random between minus 30 and 30. Um, and then we're going to add the color effect as well. So when I start as a clone, I want to change the color each time. So we go to the change color effect. Or no, we can say set the color effect to a random number. So we can say set the color effect and then we pick a random number between ooh, color effect between let's say 1 and 100 and we add that right at the beginning and now we should get differently colored balloons. This one's blue, this one's purple now and we also can get red ones and also the color effect applies to our other costumes so we also get splashes in the same color then. So the final thing I want to do is I want to clear the stage right before I um, start the game, so I always start with a fresh stage and not with all the splashes. Um, so we will add one more thing, a clear right when the game starts. And now we can try it again in full screen mode. We have a clear stage, our sprite is in, in the original position, we get balloons. We can click them by, um, uh, we can shoot at them by clicking on the stage in the right position or right direction of the mouse pointer and then the clones move towards the original mouse pointer position and whenever I get, uh, I hit a balloon it will change its costume and create these splashes on the stage. So now it's your turn, you can get creative and refine and remix that game however you like. Um, thanks for watching this and all the other units in this course. It's been a pleasure for Jens and me to share you the joy of SNAP. We wish you success with your weekly assignment and with your final exam. And of course, with your continuing journey as a programmer.